hi there. Um, the time has gone by and, and today is my last, uh, today I'll be giving my last and third lecture for the Fuller Integration Symposium. And I did not make any comments about this symposium being uh, a virtual one, <laughs> uh, but it is uh, virtual, as you know, because of the ongoing uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic that's been going on for almost a year now. And putting this together, of course, involves a lot more of uh, coordination and work. And uh, before I get into my lecture proper today, I would like to express my deepest appreciation and thanks uh, to the Fuller team that helped to put all this together. Uh, I want to thank Chantel and Andrew and Reed and other members of the tech team uh, for helping out so much. Uh, it's not been easy, but they did it very well. And um, I am a very, very uh, challenged person, technologically speaking, tech challenged, <laughs> and certainly uh, not tech savvy at all. And uh, they helped tremendously in all of this. So I want to thank them. And later, I'll thank again my assistant at Fuller, Tammy Anderson, for all the help with the word processing and uh, the uh, PowerPoints and so on. Um, sometimes I joke around and say, <laughs> by the grace of God, I may have power and I may have points when I speak, <laughs> but I do not have any PowerPoints. <laughs> but they have put the PowerPoints together for you. Um, so uh, let's pause uh, for a word of prayer before I go into my final and third lecture on the role of the Holy Spirit in Christian counseling and psychotherapy. Let's pray. So dear God, we want to thank you once more for this uh, fuller integration symposium, for the last two lectures, and now the final and third lecture on the role of the Holy Spirit in Christian counseling and psychotherapy, which is a very crucial topic in the field of integration of Christian faith and counseling and psychotherapy. I pray in the name of Jesus, that Holy Spirit of God, you will be here to anoint the sharing of uh, this lecture in your word, and particularly as we talk about you, and that you will uh, speak to us, uh, and that you will empower us uh, to be humble servants of Jesus Christ, that we will learn to be truly integrated uh, in our work in this area of Christian counseling and psychotherapy, to be Christ-centered, to be Bible-based, and to be Spirit-filled. To the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and for the blessing of lives for eternity, and the healing of lives. So we commit this whole time to you, asking you to protect us from evil, and asking that you, O oh God, be glorified, and that you will bless the people participating uh, in this symposium and uh, listening to these lectures, and especially this last one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I also want to say something uh, uh, just uh, as an aside, that I feel very, in quotes, senior, <laughs> because I just retired uh, recently from Fuller Seminary on December 31st, 2020, and I'm now a senior professor of clinical psychology at Fuller. <laughs> I'm also still serving as the senior pastor of my church, First Evangelical Church Glendale here in California. And so... Um, uh, some of the words I want to share with you come with a certain uh, heartfelt uh, uh, feeling uh, of um, just passing on the baton to some of the younger folks in this field and uh, who continue to walk with God and serve God. But I'm not retiring from the service of the Lord and the kingdom of God. I will continue to serve him in other ways. He's given me a calling to do more international ministry uh, in preaching, teaching, mentoring of younger uh, pastors leaders and uh, counselors. So uh, we'll uh, see how that all uh, unfolds in the years ahead, especially after the pandemic ends, which we pray it will uh, soon this year. And thank God for the vaccines and so on. So today, my topic for this last and final lecture is the role of the Holy Spirit in Christian counseling and psychotherapy. I wrote an article in the Baker Encyclopedia of Psychology and Counseling in 1999 on this topic, and I have since expanded and written more about this and especially in my second edition of uh, uh, the textbook, uh, my textbook, uh, Counseling and Psychotherapy, A Christian Perspective, that Baker Academic will be publishing in the spring of 2022. Just finish all the revisions and be sending in uh, the manuscript uh, uh, soon. So um, just to uh, give that a context to you. And so today in this third and final lecture, as I cover this topic, 
I want to emphasize the central, crucial, and comprehensive role of the Holy Spirit in Christian counseling and psychotherapy, and also in Christian spiritual formation. Um, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity or the Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And much has been written on the Holy Spirit from a theological perspective in the, uh, topic, on the topic of uh, pneumatology. And numerous books are now available. For example, some recent ones as well as some uh, uh, well-known ones. Allison and Kostenberger, uh, Burke and Warrington, Cole, Crisp and Sanders, Fee, Gordon Fee, Habits, Horton, our own uh, Badimati Karkainen from Fuller, Levering, Levison has written a number of books on the Holy Spirit recently, uh, Moltmann, uh, Packer, Pinnock, Thistleton, and again, our own Amos Young. Uh, and there are many others, but these are some that I have uh, referenced for those of you who are interested in reading further this, uh, very Im on this very important topic of uh, pneumatology as part of systematic theology. So, of course, I cannot do justice to the whole <clears throat> area of pneumatology in this short lecture, but I just wanted to point out that there's much that's been written on the Holy Spirit. It's the third person of the Trinity, sometimes a uh, forgotten member of the Trinity. And uh, I think my good friend Dale Bruna once called uh, the Holy Spirit the shy member of the Trinity. <laughs> but I have uh, often said he's not shy. <laughs> he can be very, uh, very uh, powerful and, and, and dramatic in how he works, but he can also work in very quiet ways. So we'll come to that more as we go along this lecture. There's also a growing literature on the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the context of Christian counseling and uh, also uh, uh, Christian therapy and personality functioning, both in articles that have been published in the literature as well as in books, books by Cole and Hall, Gilbert and Brock, Pugh, Sutton, Vining, Vining and Decker and others. And the articles are quite a number of them. I will not cite the references there in my uh, uh, lecture in my paper. I want to at this point especially mention Jeffrey Sutton, S-U-T-T-O-N, Jeffrey, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y, Jeffrey Sutton's most recent book, 2021, uh, it just came out about a couple of months ago, but copyrighted 2021, on counseling and psychotherapy with uh, Pentecostal and charismatic Christians, covering culture and research and assessment and practice. Now, the crucial role of the Holy Spirit in Christian counseling and psychotherapy is supported in Scripture that describes the Holy Spirit as the counselor, comforter, helper, or advocate. These are all English uh, words uh, that uh, are used in translating the Greek. Uh, and, uh, for example, in John chapter 14, verses 16 to 17. And as Adams has pointed out, at least three persons are involved in every counseling situation. Three, not two. There's the counselor, there's the client or counselee, and it's the Holy Spirit, uh, who is the counselor, par excellence, is the most excellent counselor. And to do uh, good, effective Christian counseling and psychotherapy, we definitely need the presence and power of the Spirit and to depend on Him and to be much more aware of His presence with us. The Nicene Creed, for example, describes the Holy Spirit as the giver of life, based on both uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Parker has expanded on this, and uh, so has Cole, Levison, and others. His key role in Christian counseling and therapy as a counselor, as well as giver of life, means that Christian counselors and therapists need to prayerfully depend on the Holy Spirit's presence and healing power in every counseling or therapy situation or session. And we need to have a basic understanding of the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, so I'm going to go into this in more detail now. Um, but this is important not just for the uh, work of uh, Christian counseling and psychotherapy, but in all of our ministries, including pastoral ministry. And I have recently written another textbook on pastoral ministry entitled Shepherding God's People, a guide to faithful and fruitful pastoral ministry that was published by Baker Academic in 2019. And in that book, I have a chapter there on the crucial role of the Holy Spirit in pastoral ministry. The Holy Spirit is crucial because He is God, and he works in all of these ministries that God calls us to. So as you can see from the PowerPoint slide, I'm going to now talk about the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit based on 10, 1999 and 2022. Now the person and work of the Holy Spirit, as I said earlier, are crucial and essential in our lives and ministries, including pastoral ministry and counseling. And we need to be sensitive and open to the Spirit, as Scott McKnight wrote about uh, recently in his book, 
2018, open to the spirit. Also Sam Storms, 2017, practicing the power. The Holy Spirit's power and presence can be accessed and experienced through the traditional spiritual disciplines as power connectors to the spirit, as means of grace. As I wrote with Doug Gregg, 10 Greg, 1997, disciplines of the Holy Spirit. We should look at spiritual disciplines as disciplines of the Holy Spirit, not of self-effort. The Spirit is the one who empowers us even to enter into the spiritual disciplines. And as well as through the authentic disciplines or circumstantial disciplines that Gary Thomas described in his 2002 book, Authentic Faith the power of a fire-tested life. And I've also uh, written about this in my book in 2006 on full service, F-U-L-L, full service, moving from self-serve Christianity to total servanthood. A book on servanthood, not leadership, and not servant leadership, which has sometimes been oversold. But servanthood is crucial from a biblical perspective. However, we need to keep in mind that the Holy Spirit is sovereign as God and can work in his own spontaneous and mysterious ways to anoint us with his power anytime, anywhere, and in any way he wants to, even without us doing anything like practicing the traditional spiritual disciplines. The Holy Spirit as God is everywhere and has worked in all types of situations and circumstances with and in all kinds of people, including all of creation throughout the centuries and all ages of history. Levinson has emphasized this and especially Thistleton. The Holy Spirit has been described as God in us, God with us, and God transforming us, as the one who transforms and transcends our human abilities. Uh, Scott McKnight in his book, Open to the Spirit, 2018. The Holy Spirit's presence and power are essential in our lives and ministries, including counseling and psychotherapy that can be viewed as work in the Spirit, Kunz and 10, 1996, and even as a spiritual discipline. Counseling and uh, psychotherapy from Christian perspective can be viewed as a spiritual discipline because it helps us to grow in Christ, as uh, White uh, emphasized in a recent article in 2020. Scripture strongly states that it is not by might, nor by, nor by power, but, my but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty, Zechariah 4, 6, that his work is accomplished. Jesus himself definitively asserted that apart from me, he says, you can do nothing, John 15, uh, 5. And in Ephesians 5, 18, we are commanded to be continually filled with the Spirit again and again. So we are not to grieve the Spirit, Ephesians 4.30, with the sins of the flesh or sinful nature, such as bitterness, <clears throat> rage and anger, brawling, slander and malice, and not to quench the Spirit or put out His fire, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, with unbelief or evil. We therefore need to yield to the Holy Spirit and ask to be filled with the Spirit through prayer for Him to take control of our lives and anoint us with His presence and power. He is in us if we are Christians, but He can uh, also uh, fill us more with His power and presence as we yield to His control and the Lordship of Christ. The following is a brief prayer that may be helpful for those of us who desire to be filled with the Spirit according to Ephesians 5.18 and to ask for Him to empower us to both become more like Jesus in spiritual formation, in our character, as well as in our ministries. Uh, including counseling and psychotherapy. So here's a short prayer that I have taken uh, and adapted from my book uh, in 2019, Shepherding God's People. Dear Father, I come to you and ask in the name of Jesus for you to cleanse me and fill me with the Holy Spirit and His power and presence so that I can become more like Jesus in my life and ministries, including counseling and psychotherapy. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a short, simple prayer, but it helps us to actualize practically in prayer how to be filled with the Spirit. And it's a prayer that we should be praying every day in every moment of our lives as we walk with the Lord and serve Him, even in counseling and therapy ministries. Now, as mentioned earlier, the Holy Spirit is sovereign and He can work in His own spontaneous and mysterious ways, His wonders to perform, including anointing us afresh with His power and presence from above. Uh, by God's sheer grace and goodness and generosity, without us doing anything or taking any form formulaic steps or practicing the traditional spiritual disciplines. Anthony Thistleton, in uh, his uh, key book in 2013 on the Holy Spirit, Anthony Thistleton has highlighted the ascending ministry of the Spirit in initiating and inspiring prayer, worship, and thanksgiving. It's all parts of uh, uh, traditional spiritual disciplines. Uh, so the ascending ministry of the Holy Spirit is as important and parallel to his descending work of inspiration and empowerment 
which we often emphasize. We therefore need the help and ministry of the Holy Spirit, even in the practice of spiritual disciplines, such as prayer and worship. We serve the Lord in dependence on the Lord and the power of the Spirit, and not by our own self-effort, centered in our individual giftings, skills, competence, or methods, oftentimes overemphasized and oversold in our culture and our society today. Ultimately, it is the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of love, as Amos Young has uh, described, who empowers us to love God and others, including our enemies, and to manifest that love as the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22-23, in our lives in service to others, even unto death, if need be, in following Jesus all the way. Romans 5, 5 states, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, in my book on disciplines of the Holy Spirit, Ken and Greg, 1997, we delineated the following blessings or results of the Spirit-filled life. For example, and I quote, greater love and intimacy with God, exaltation of Jesus as Son of God and Savior, power and boldness to witness and preach, greater wisdom and faith, deep joy, for example, in singing and worship, release of spiritual gifts for ministry, victory over sin and temptation, effectiveness and power through prayer, quiet confidence during opposition, deeper trust in Scripture as the Word of God, renewed zeal for evangelism, and fresh love of Christ and others. Page 21. The Holy Spirit can at times also lead us as He led Jesus into the wilderness to encounter temptations and spiritual warfare, paradoxically, and sometimes even experience dark nights of the soul. See Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. The, the filling of the Spirit can also result in both dramatic external manifestations, including speaking in tongues, as in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19, as well as relatively less dramatic and more quiet manifestations, such as boldness in preaching or witnessing, deep faith and wisdom and joy. X4, X6, X11, and X13. The Holy Spirit will also help us to pray in the Spirit. Romans 8, 26, Ephesians 6, 18, Jude 20, see also Hebrews 5, 7. He will help us to pray in the Spirit, empowered by Him, on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers that can include the following as examples, with words or without words, including wordless groans, with tongues or without tongues, with tears or without tears, with lament or praise and thanksgiving and worship and all, with confession and requests of all kinds in petition for self and intercession for others. You know, one of the things that we have not talked about or emphasized enough uh, in our contemporary culture and, and Christian uh, circles today is the gift of tears that the early church fathers and mothers uh, talked about and they knew intimately that this is a work of the Spirit. A gift from the Spirit in a generic sense that He gives us the capacity and ability to have tears, to weep in prayer, in worship, sometimes with joy, sometimes with lament, sometimes with sorrow. And remember that one of the shortest verses in the Bible, I think there are two of them, but this is one of them, John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And if we walk in the Spirit, in intimacy with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Spirit will lead us into times of weeping and tears in worship as well as in prayer. So now I will cover in more detail <clears throat> three major ways in which the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit can be further described from a biblical perspective. This is, of course, not exhaustive. There's so much more uh, in the field of pneumatology, and doctrine of the Holy Spirit. But these three major aspects of the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit are crucial, particularly in the area of uh, Christian counseling and psychotherapy. These three areas are, first, the Spirit's power and gifts, secondly, the Spirit's truth, and thirdly, the Spirit's fruit, uh, all of which are particularly relevant and helpful in Christian counseling and psychotherapy. So as you can see from the PowerPoint slide, the first one is the Spirit's power and gifts, based on passages in Scripture like Acts 1.8, Ephesians 5.18, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4. This last four texts, of course, have to do with the gifts of the Spirit. So first, let me just point out that the power of the Holy Spirit is essential in evangelism and witnessing, as Acts 1.8 says. There, Jesus says that you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit for witnessing 
specifically in evangelistic and mission work, but also in other ministries, such as pastoral and church ministries, as well as counseling, as I've emphasized already. We need to be continually filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the Spirit is in the present continuous tense in the Greek. Be continually filled with the Spirit, moment by moment, day by day, as we surrender to Him and ask Him to take control of our lives. And as we walk in or by the Spirit, Galatians 5, uh, 16. Uh, and so that we do not give in to the desires of the flesh or sinful nature. And we keep in step with the Spirit. As J. I. Packer has emphasized in his book, keep in step with the Spirit by faith as we live by the Spirit, the giver of life and power, Galatians 5, 25. As we prayerfully surrender to the Holy Spirit, and that's specifically for His filling, He empowers us and helps us to become more like Jesus and to do the works of Jesus, as Jack Hayford emphasized in the article he wrote in 2005, in our service and ministries, including Christian counseling and psychotherapy. So really, it's the Holy Spirit who empowers us and transforms us, not the spiritual disciplines per se, but He can use them. The Holy Spirit often works uh, by sovereignly and supernaturally manifesting Himself through spiritual gifts, which are described as the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Sam Storms, in his book, Practicing the Power, puts it this way, and I quote, The gifts are God himself working in and through us. They are concrete, often tangible and vocal disclosures of divine power showcased through human activity. A charism or a gift of the Spirit is the Holy Spirit himself coming to clear and sometimes dramatic expression in the lives of God's people as they minister to one another. Sam Storms, 2017, page 15. Now, there are various listings and descriptions of spiritual gifts, conventionally understood. And Hathaway, in a 2018 article in the Journal of Psychology and Christianity, reviews some of that. And, and, and a well-known list, by the way, with an accompanying spiritual gifts inventory has been provided and described by Peter Wagner, who used to teach at Fuller years ago. Uh, in 2005, his updated and revised and expanded edition of his book, Your Spiritual Gifts Can Help Your Church Grow. And he actually describes the following 28 spiritual gifts based on scripture. For example, uh, uh, see Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4, and other passages in scripture. But his list is the longest, and some of them are more uh, kind of uh, indirectly uh, alluded to in scripture. So I'm just going to read the 28 uh, spiritual gifts as conventionally understood. Prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, mercy, wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, apostle, <clears throat> excuse me, helps, administration, evangelist, pastor, celibacy, voluntary poverty, martyrdom, hospitality, missionary, intercession, deliverance, and, le and leading worship. These are the 28 spiritual gifts that Peter Wagner lists. It's the most comprehensive and longest list of, of, of all the authors you can read in this area. I want to point out here, though, <clears throat> that there are other authors who have interpreted spiritual gifts not as special abilities given by the Holy Spirit to us. This is the conventional view, of course. But instead, as different ministries, not abilities, but ministries that the Holy Spirit calls us to serve in in order to build up the body of Christ or the church. You can refer to uh, uh, Aker, A-K-E-R, or Aker, 2002, and Birding, 2006, with this uh, more uh, uh, alternative or less traditional view of the spiritual gifts. However we view spiritual gifts, whether traditionally as spiritual, uh, uh, sorry, as uh, special abilities given by the Spirit, or as different ministries also given by the Spirit, spiritual gifts can be seen as droplets of grace, as uh, Russ Spittler, who used to be at Fuller, uh, used to say, uh, spiritual gifts are droplets of grace, gracelets, the gifts of grace that God gives us that we do not deserve. Nothing to do with our abilities and the empowers to be able to do the work of God. So they're droplets of grace from God to empower and enable us to be faithful and fruitful in whatever ministries He has called us to serve in, to glorify God and to bless others for eternity. We receive these spiritual gifts from the Spirit with gratitude, love, and humility as we serve God and others, including in the ministry of Christian counseling and psychotherapy. Spiritual gifts that may be especially helpful for an effective counseling ministry include the following, as I've described before. 
Uh, for example, the gift of exhortation or encouragement, Romans 12, 8. Gift of healing, 1 Corinthians 12, 9, 28. Wisdom or word of wisdom, 1 Corinthians 12, 8. Knowledge or word of knowledge, 1 Corinthians 12, 8. Discerning of spirits, 1 Corinthians 12, 10. And mercy, Romans 12, 8. Other spiritual gifts that may be viewed as important and relevant for counseling ministries, especially from a Pentecostal or charismatic perspective, include the following. Prophecy, teaching, faith, miracles, tongues, and intercession. Hathaway, in a recent article in 2018, reviewed several spiritual gift inventories and their validity and function, and reported the lack of validity and other important psychometric properties. We need to keep this in mind. Therefore, great care and caution should therefore, uh, as I said earlier, be uh, exercised in the use of spiritual gift inventories due to the danger or risk of misinterpreting or over-interpreting them. So be careful of spiritual gifts inventories and how we use them or interpret them because we can misuse them and over-interpret or misinterpret them uh, because of their lack of validity and sometimes reliability as well. Now I want to move on to the second major aspect of the Spirit's uh, ministry and work, which is the Spirit's truth. And I see the PowerPoint here based on John 14, 16 to 17 and verse 26, and then John 16, 13. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of truth, and He will teach us and guide us to all truth, John 14 and John 16. This includes psychotheological truth that is central and salient in all integration endeavors, including the context of counseling and psychotherapy. Such eternal truth is ultimately what will set us free, John 8, 32, in which Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And the truth is centered in Jesus Christ, who is the truth himself, John 14, 6. It's the way, the truth, and the life. And the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of Scripture as God's Word. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 2 Peter 1.20-21. He will guide us as Christian counselors and psychotherapists to use Scripture in our clinical practice in empathic, compassionate, sensitive, wise, and deeply helpful ways or loving ways with our clients, bringing healing and wholeness or shalom to them in the midst of their pain and struggles in life. However, the Holy Spirit will never contradict the eternal truth of Scripture or God's inspired word, properly interpreted and illuminated, with His help, of course, because he's in, He inspired the writing of Scripture. He will always uphold the veracity and the validity of Scripture in all areas of life and ministry, including counseling and therapy, being consistent with the moral and ethical aspects of biblical truth and teaching. So the Spirit's truth is very important, and we evangelical Christians have emphasized this area very much. The first aspect or area I just uh, finished talking about earlier on the Spirit's power and gifts and is often emphasized in the Pentecostal and charismatic uh, contexts and circles. But here there's a third area, and it's the Spirit's fruit. And uh, can, as you can see from the slide there, based on Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. The Holy Spirit also produces the fruit of the Spirit, mentioned in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, that refers mainly and basically to Christ-like love or agape, that is the hallmark of mature Christ-likeness. Romans 8, 29, Galatians 4, 19, to become more like Jesus, be conformed to the image of Christ, Christ being formed in us. And this is uh, uh, what is uh, genuine Christian spiritual formation. The fruit of the Spirit is, interesting, isn't it? And all the English translations is singular because the Greek is singular in Galatians 5, 20 to 23, uh, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, primarily, mainly, and actually, you can even say only love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, Christ-like love. That can also be manifested in eight other uh, uh, characteristics or manifestations. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, okay? also manifested in joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness or humility, and self-control in Galatians 5. Such Christ-like fruit cannot be faked or manufactured by ourselves or uh, with our own self-efforts, but it can only be produced or brought forth by the Holy Spirit within us as we abide and remain, and remain in Christ, John 15, 5. This agape love from the Spirit of love, as, as uh, Young and Pinnock have described, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of love, is powerfully therapeutic and healing in counseling ministries and the therapeutic process and relationship with the client. Uh, when uh, psychologists and researchers talk about warmth 
and empathy and genuineness. These are just the psychological uh, 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 aspects of agape love. Agape love is you know, at least that, but even more than that. You know, it's deeper than that. It is also essential in all other pastoral and church ministries. For without love, we are nothing and have achieved nothing, as 1 Corinthians 13 states. In my book in 2019 on shepherding God's people, I made the following conclusion at the end of the book on pastoral ministry. The pastoral ministry uh, is really uh, ultimately, it is ultimately about God and about people and about love. It is about shepherding God's people with love. Page 208. So love is really the key here. And it is Christ-like love, God's love, not our own. And I think it was Gordon Alport many years ago, a well-known social psychologist and psychologist of religion, who said that love is the most powerful therapeutic force in the world. And many, many uh, therapists have come to conclude that. And our research shows that, particularly as it is expressed in warmth and empathy and genuineness. All these major aspects of the Holy Spirit's work I've just covered in his ministry, power, truth, and love, are crucial and essential and should exist and function together in biblical balance. Because power without love can result in abuse. Power without truth can lead to heresy. However, power rooted in biblical truth and appropriately and gently used with Christ-like love can be deeply therapeutic and bring healing and wholeness to clients in the brokenness and pain of their lives. It can also bring uh, renewal and revival. All right now, what I want to do is to move into the work of the Holy Spirit in counseling and psychotherapy itself in this particular context, K keeping in mind these three major aspects of the Holy Spirit's work and ministry. So as you can see on the PowerPoint slide here, uh, I will just uh, cover this uh, generally and then specifically dive into five uh, uh, basic ways that the Holy Spirit can work in a counseling session. Uh, later on in this lecture. So more generally, the work of the Holy Spirit in counseling and psychotherapy. As I mentioned earlier, the Holy Spirit can work in various and different ways in his sovereign and healing ministry during a counseling or therapy session, in both implicit or quiet integration and explicit integration where we use spiritual resources more uh, directly and overtly and discuss spiritual issues uh, more verbally and openly. So in both implicit and explicit integration, which I covered in the last uh, lecture in clinical practice. In more implicit integration approaches to therapy, for example, psychodynamic or psychoanalytic therapy, the Holy Spirit's work as giver of life may be emphasized more, such as Parker in an article in 2008 in the Journal of Psychology and Theology has done in his description of the Spirit's creative work in therapy that makes use of Winnicott's object relations theory and the concepts of transitional phenomena and object usage. The Spirit can touch clients by, I quote from his article, Parker 2008, conferring a sense of identity and providing an environment for emergence of a strong spiritual self and in engendering new life by making God real in ways that transcend our imaginings, page 292. The life-giving work of the Spirit also helps the client to hold on to a basic sense of hope, even when all the client's wishes, dreams, disappointments, fears, and frustrations have been spent. This is page 292. And by making God real to the client, in other words, in the midst of subjectively experiencing the absence of God. The Holy Spirit can similarly work in implicit integration that is intentional and incarnational, as in relational psychodynamic therapy, as Terrell has pointed out, uh, 2007, object relations therapy, Rogers, 2007, and relational psychoanalysis, Blend and Strawn, 2014, and M.T. Hoffman, 2011. The Spirit's work in these therapy sessions is quietly but intentionally and prayerfully embraced and expressed by the Christian therapist and experienced by the client in the empathy and agape love of the Spirit in the therapeutic process and relationship. The deep but quiet work of the Spirit is manifested in the transcendent moments and creative experiences in implicit integration rather than in more explicit and overt ways, such as the verbal use of prayer and scripture and other spiritual resources. Psychotherapy in these implicit but intentional and incarnational approaches is still work in the spirit, as Kunst and Tan have described, and because the Holy Spirit said work in more reflective and quiet ways. John Pugh in 2008 has pointed out that the Holy Spirit works in and through the daily awful experiences 
of human existence, page 280 in his book. The Holy Spirit can also work in explicit integration approaches in Christian counseling and psychotherapy that more overtly and directly and systematic, systematically use spiritual resources such as prayer and scripture and other spiritual disciplines and more directly and verbally deal with spiritual and religious issues in therapy sessions with clients. While the Holy Spirit can work in whatever way, at whatever time, with whoever and through what, whoever he wants to, there are at least five ways that he can work during a therapy session, especially in a more explicit integration approach. So as you can see from the PowerPoint slide here, I will go through the five ways. First, and by the way, these are not exhaustive. It's just some examples. First, the Holy Spirit can directly empower or enable the Christian therapist to discern the root problems of the client more accurately and perhaps more quickly by giving relevant and specific words of knowledge or wisdom, 1 Corinthians 12 a, to the Christian therapist in assessing and helping the client. Chuck Swindoll, from a more conservative evangelical perspective in 1994, described such experiences of receiving words of knowledge or wisdom from the Spirit as inner promptings or nudges of the Spirit within the Christian counselor who is preferably attentive to the Spirit's leading. These promptings or words of knowledge or wisdom from the Spirit can also enable the Christian counselor to more deeply engage in spiritual conversation with the client, or soul talk, as Crab in 2003 puts it. Flash press, as Richard Foster describes them, can be quietly used by a Christian therapist during counseling or therapy session to be more mindfully attentive to the Holy Spirit and His presence and power. For example, throughout the uh, therapy session, quietly, flash press can be uttered by the therapist. Uh, such as, Spirit of God, please guide me. Holy Spirit, please minister to the client with your healing grace. Holy Spirit, help us at this point of being stuck. Holy Spirit, comfort and strengthen the client. Spirit of God, protect us and empower us. Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. This can also occur in more implicit integration approaches, such as relational, uh, psychodynamic, or psychoanalytic therapy. The Holy Spirit will help us to pray in the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 18 and Jude 20, often with wordless groans or groanings within us. Romans 8, 26. Second, the Holy Spirit can provide clear spiritual direction regarding God's will to both the Christian therapist and the client as they engage in more explicit integration practices during a session, including praying together, using and discussing scripture, and, opening, uh, sorry, and openly dealing with spiritual issues and struggles. As already mentioned, the Spirit can also do this and provide clear guidance and spiritual direction during a session in more implicit integration approaches. Third, the Holy Spirit can directly minister to and deeply touch a client in powerful ways with his healing grace and transforming power. This experience can happen anytime according to God's sovereign grace and goodness and the supernatural ministry of the Spirit, sometimes leading to sudden insight and epiphanies that result in deep transformation of ordinary lives, or what has been called uh, and described as quantum change by Miller and C. De Becker in 2001. Quantum change special breakthroughs in therapy sessions. These transcendent moments, including quantum change experiences, can however be helpfully facilitated by the explicit use of prayer, including inner healing prayer or healing of memories. The direct touch of the spirit in transcendent and creative moments in a therapy session can of course also occur in more implicit integration approaches to therapy. Fourth, the Holy Spirit can enable the Christian therapist to discern the presence of the demonic and the demonization or demonic oppression in the client's life. Uh, he can uh, more specifically give the Christian therapist the spiritual gift of discerning of spirits or distinguishing between spirits, 1 Corinthians 12, 10, which can be especially helpful in making an accurate differential diagnosis between demonization and mental disorder or a dual diagnosis of both demonization and mental disorder coexisting in the client. The Holy Spirit can also empower the Christian therapist to deal effectively and victoriously over the demonic if it is present by helping the therapist to pray effective prayers for deliverance and protection from the demonic if that is necessary and appropriate, always with full informed consent and collaboration from the client. Usually, however, it may be more appropriate to refer the client with possible demonization to a deliverance specialist or pastor or deliverance prayer ministry team experienced in deliverance preferably within the client's own denomination or church. Uh, Appleby and Buffett and McNutt are references that we can consult on this whole topic of uh, 
demonization and dealing with the demonic, a topic that uh, we do not uh, often deal with, uh, even in integration context, but we need to, uh, without um, exaggerating or over-dramatizing this whole area. Uh, but with biblical common sense and biblical guidance, we need to deal with this. Ephesians 6 teaches very clearly uh, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against uh, forces of evil in high places and, and the demonic uh, forces that we need to deal with how to uh, uh, tackle these kinds of uh, spiritual uh, warfare, spiritual attacks. But of course, uh, biblically speaking, Jesus has already conquered sin, Satan and death on the cross and by his resurrection. So let us learn to handle this area with proper rejoicing in the Lord and having the uh, authority of the believer and our victory in Jesus Christ already, that uh, we must not uh, enter into this area with fear but with faith and trust in the Lord and to give him uh, praise and uh, space for him to manifest his victory as we pray for people, and sometimes even for deliverance, whether in the counseling context or otherwise. But here we have to be very careful. We need to have informed consent. And as I said earlier, uh, it'd be better to refer to a uh, prayer ministry team. Fifth and finally, the Holy Spirit can work deeply in the Christian spiritual formation into deeper Christ-likeness of both the client and therapist as they engage in the practice of the traditional spiritual disciplines, such as the ones I've described in my book with Doug Gray on disciplines of the Holy Spirit, solitude and silence, listening and guidance, prayer and intercession, study and meditation on God's word, repentance and confession, yielding and submission, fasting, worship, fellowship, simplicity, service and witness and there are many other traditional spiritual disciplines, but always in the power of the Spirit. As well as, as we reflect on and discuss growing and meaning-making through the authentic disciplines or circumstantial spiritual disciplines that are not usually within our control or choice, such as suffering, waiting, mourning, sacrifice, persecution, contentment, and hope and fear. And Gary Thomas has uh, described them in his book, Authentic Faith, and I also uh, uh, deal with them in my book on full service. Some of these spiritual disciplines can be practiced or discussed in a therapy session, while others can be assigned as homework tasks to be completed in between therapy sessions by the client. They can help both the therapist and client to more deeply experience the Spirit's presence and power for the client's growth and healing, of course. It is the Holy Spirit, however, who ultimately brings about deep spiritual and psychological transformation, whether implicitly or explicitly, in the client, as well as in the therapist. And... Um, a number of different people have written on this, Cole and Hall, Collicut, Eck, Gaultier, Gaultier and Gaultier, uh, Barber and Jones, Chan, Chandler, Fee, Greenman and Kalansis, and myself. This is the sovereign work of God and by His grace alone, so that the Spirit can work in any way He wants to, even without or apart from the spiritual disciplines, as I pointed out earlier. Now, I want to make a comment here that's very important. It is therefore... Also, not totally true to say that a therapist can lead a client to go or grow only as far as the therapist has spiritually and psychologically. I've heard this said many, many times with many, many different people. You can only take your client, you can only take people as far as you've gone yourself. And you know what's my response to that? God have mercy on us. That's true. And I'm so glad that's not true. You know, because we have not gone very far. <laughs> All of us have not gone very far or grown very much. And, and, and if people's growth uh, is completely dependent on how much we have grown and how far we've gone, then God have mercy on us. But I praise the Lord. It is the Holy Spirit who brings growth and transformation so that the Holy Spirit can and often will bring both therapists and clients beyond their current levels of functioning and growth to further growth. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God. To God alone be the glory for the deep and wonderful things He has done and is doing and will do. By His grace alone, God can take all of us further than we have gone, both therapist and client. That way we relax in the Lord more. We trust in His grace more. We are um, deeply thankful and grateful for His blessings. And uh, we rest in Him more. It's not up to me to bring people further along. It's up to the Holy Spirit, God Himself, to bring me and others, including clients, further along. Hallelujah. That's a very important point I want to make. Then it will be helpful for us also to keep in mind the meaning of genuine Christian spiritual formation. What does it mean? 
to become more like Jesus. Jeffrey Greenman in 2010 gives us this very succinct and theologically rich definition. Spiritual formation is our continuing response to the reality of God's grace, shaping us into the likeness of Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit in the community of faith for the sake of the world. Now, the work of the Holy Spirit then in Christian counseling and psychotherapy is therefore crucial, central, and comprehensive in bringing about deep and genuine growth and healing, psychologically and spiritually, in the client. And it's a side effect in the therapist too. You know, what has been called the helper therapy principle by Reisman in 1965? There's such a thing called the helper therapy principle that helpers or counselors are actually blessed and helped in the process of helping others. You know, in giving, we receive. So uh, the, the therapist also grows through the work of counseling and therapy. Of course, we do not focus on our own growth and benefit. It's always for the benefit of the client. But God is so gracious as he brings healing and transformation and wholeness and shalom to the client. He also, as a side effect, blesses and gives uh, healing and uh, shalom to the therapist as well. So thank God for this uh, uh, unique ministry uh, and work of counseling and psychotherapy. Now, although training and competence in therapy skills are needed, Christian therapists will use such skills in dependence on the Holy Spirit as a counselor par excellence. Uh, Christian uh, therapists will also use such skills in dependence on the Holy Spirit, as I said, sorry, in their clinical training, practice, and supervision. A Christian approach to counseling and psychotherapy will therefore be Christ-centered, biblically-based, and spirit-filled to the glory of God and the blessing and healing of persons, including both the client and the therapist. Now, in this context, let me also point out again, a Christian therapist so led and filled with the Spirit can relax and rest more in the Lord as the hard and deep work of counseling and therapy is done in the power and presence of the Spirit, in dependence on God's grace. You see. We're not the hero. The Lord is the center of it all. And we can just relax, both therapist and client, relax in a good sense so we don't take uh, 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 too much responsibility uh, on ourselves and then get burned out much more easily. We cast our cares upon the Lord. We cast the cares of the client upon the Lord. And the Lord will undertake for all of us. Underneath are his everlasting arms, holding us up. Deuteronomy 33, 27. So I have a few concluding comments as I end. In this series of three lectures for the 2021 Fuller Integration Symposium, that's now gone virtual, I have spoken on the overall theme of a Christian approach to counseling and psychotherapy, colon, Christ-centered, biblically-based, and spirit-filled. I've attempted to deal with this topic as broadly as possible, both from theological and psychological perspectives. It is nevertheless still a Christian approach, not the one and only Christian approach. So I want to humbly uh, acknowledge that, and this is a Christian approach that I trust and pray will be helpful to all of you. Now, I'd like to end with several concluding comments. You will see some of these also in my uh, second edition of my textbook, 2022. So here are the comments. First, as Christian therapists, we need to have faith or trust in Jesus Christ as Lord of all our professions and all of our academic disciplines, including psychology, and then more specifically, counseling or psychotherapy. As uh, Eric Johnson wrote in an article in 1997 in the Journal of Psychology and Theology, Christ, the Lord of Psychology. As spirit-filled, biblically-based, and Christ-centered servants of Jesus Christ, Christian therapists will have faith and full confidence in Christ Christ as the most brilliant person in the universe, as Dallas Willard has emphasized, who is also both master and maestro of every field or discipline of study, including counseling and psychotherapy. So remember that Jesus Christ is the most brilliant person and he's our Lord. Not Freud, not Rogers, not Beck, not Alice, or any other name you want to insert there in terms of well-known uh, leaders in the field of therapy and counseling. But Jesus Christ. We learn from these others. Yes. We humbly learn from good research, good theory, uh, good psychology, but we also learn to discern what is not so good and put that away and let Jesus be Lord and the Bible, his word, uh, our guide. Second, Christian therapists who practice a Christ-centered, biblically-based and spiritual approach to counseling and psychotherapy by faith will experience the eternal kind of life that Jesus came to give us. John 3, 16, John 10, 10. Eternal life, the eternal kind of life. That's how Dallas Willard puts it and will also help their clients to experience such authentic, authentic life in the context of 
the therapeutic relationship and the therapeutic process and in therapy. Dallas Willard, in an article he wrote in Christian Counseling Today in 1996, uh, uh, wrote the following words that are still relevant and powerful for us today, and I quote, Many counselors today are learning that for their own work, deep immersion in the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines, is necessary, both for developing their own character and beyond that, accessing special powers of grace for their work in counseling people. Many psychologists are learning how to use techniques of prayer and various kinds of ministry to have a much greater effect than they could have if all they had to go on with just the things they learned in their clinical training programs. I think the most important and the most solid way is to begin to integrate prayer and spiritual teaching into the therapy process as it seems appropriate. I think the issue here lies deeper than even matters of integration as we commonly discuss it. It is a matter of our understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ as one which breaks through the natural world and brings it into the spiritual world and invites us as individuals to learn to live an eternal kind of life now, not just in heaven to come. Willard, 1996, pages 19 to 20 in Christian Counseling Today. Third, I would like to note that over four decades ago, Two prominent leaders in the field of secular psychotherapy, both psychiatrists, Jerome Frank, 1982, and Isaac Marx, 1978, had already issued a challenge to psychotherapy researchers to give more attention to the role of healing power, of faith healing, involving faith and religious processes in psychotherapy and its possible powerful effects on therapeutic outcomes. Although there's now strong and solid empirical evidence supporting the effectiveness of religious and spiritual therapies, including Christian therapies, uh, Kaptari 2018, Hope et al. 2019, and Kaptari et al. 2018, there's still a need for further well-controlled outcome research, more specifically, or more specifically on religious and spiritual healing interventions, uh, including Christian inner healing prayer and the effectiveness in Christian therapy. So the Holy Spirit will help us uh, to develop and practice a genuinely Christian approach to counseling and therapy. This will require active participation in and involvement with a community of Christian scholars, and Christian counselors and psychologists, as well as others, as some recent authors in the integration field have emphasized in relational, embodied, and community-based approaches to integration. See Neff and McMinn, Sandage and Brown, Strawn and Brown, Hall and Hall, Sorensen, Sorensen et al. It will only be by God's grace and the work of the Holy Spirit that we as Christian counselors and therapists will keep the faith or be faithful to Jesus Christ as Lord and be kept in the faith in Him in our clinical practice as well as research and theory building, as I wrote about in Ken 2008. Finally, as I come to the conclusion of this series of lectures and this last lecture, I'd like to end this third and final lecture on a more personal note. I want to especially thank Tammy Anderson, my assistant at Fuller Theological Seminary, who significantly helped me with the word processing and PowerPoint slides for my lectures, for suggesting that I share more personally at some point in these lectures. As I briefly mentioned in my first lecture, I've written a few autobiographical book chapters in which I shared some details of my life and integration journey of pilgrimage as a Christian psychologist and pastor in a more personal, relational, embodied, and communal context, 10, 1993, 2005, 2010. I would like to quote from the personal letter I wrote at the end of my book chapter of my integration journey and reflections as a Christian psychologist and pastor uh, in 2010 in Glenn Moriarty's edited book, Integrating Faith and Psychology. 12 psychologists tell their stories. And this letter contains six core lessons that I've learned in my integration journey that are still relevant today, that I trust will be of some help and blessing to you in your own integration journey and pilgrimage of faith in Christ as I end. So here's the letter and I read parts of it. Dear friend, I would like to share with you some lessons that I've learned and any wisdom that I may have gained in my integration journey so far as a Christian psychologist and pastor. First, I would recommend that you set as your first priority your relationship and walk with the Lord, that he will always be your first love, Revelation 2.4, and that you will love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, Mark 12, 29 to 31. The graceful practice of the spiritual disciplines on a regular basis will be essential, including a daily quiet time alone with the Lord, and periodic longer personal retreats with him for a day or two or longer, sometimes up to a week or more. Practicing the presence of God throughout the day, for example, by using flash press often, will also help much. It is out of such deep and intimate relationship with the Lord that you will come to know and understand truth more fully, including the psychotheological truth that is foundational for all good integration, that is for all integration that is Christ-centered, Bible-based, and spirit-filled. Second, I want to thank God for the many mentors, formal or informal, whom he has graciously sent into my life. 
I've learned so much from them. I wish, however, that some of my earlier mentors had taught me more firmly the need to set limits and to not take on too much, as well as to live a more balanced life, balance in quotes, with adequate rest and sleep, good nutrition, and regular exercise. Uh, as an aside, let me just point out that I've experienced burnout before, especially in my younger days. And so uh, that's the context for these comments in this letter. May you learn these precious lessons early on in your integration journey. I pray and wish for you to have a few good mentors, especially humble, loving, and Christ like Christian mentors who will provide the loving support, intellectual stimulation, rigorous challenge, spiritual direction, and faithful prayers for you in your integration journey. Third, there's much helpful literature that's now available on the integration of Christian faith and psychology, including therapy, that is essential reading for you. <coughs> Recent work on developing a distinctively Christian psychology that's more substantially grounded in uh, biblical and historical theology, as well as in scripture itself, is also required reading for you and me. In this regard, it is of ultimate importance and value to be saturated with Scripture as the inspired eternal Word of God, 2 Timothy 3.16. Fourth, learn to be filled daily with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5.18, by confession of sins and by yielding to Him and the Lordship of Christ. Each day in prayer, ask Him to anoint you afresh with His wisdom, truth, power, and love as well as with the spiritual gifts that will equip you to be a more faithful and fruitful servant of Jesus Christ, capable of doing good integration work. Be prayerfully dependent on the Holy Spirit, who is the counselor or comforter par excellence, John 14, especially in clinical practice or therapy with clients, where his agape love can be manifested at least in a warm, empathic, and genuine therapeutic relationship with clients. Fifth, be thankful for how we are wounded healers ourselves. Remember that God can use your own suffering and struggles to expand and deepen your capacity for empathy and compassionate caring as manifested in the form of agape love that you can share with your clients and with others who are suffering. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4. Gratitude will also help you experience growth through trials and struggles, seeing them as opportunities to become more Christ-like and spiritually mature rather than seeing them as hindrances. Finally, I'd like to suggest that you do not make psychology, therapy, or even the integration task to be everything in your life. Instead, seek the Lord and His kingdom first, Matthew 6, 33, and always see the bigger picture of God's will and God's kingdom with loving obedience to Him. This means living the eternal kind of life for eternal life, a life in the kingdom where He rules and reigns over every area of your life and mind. It includes enough time for yourself and your family, as well as time for the church as a loving community of faith and as a larger family of God. It includes enough time to reach out to others, especially the lost, the oppressed, and the broken, reaching out with the good news of Jesus Christ, who alone can ultimately save us all. I'd like to wish you the Lord's best and deepest blessings as you walk on with Him in your integration journey. God bless. With His love and prayers, warmly, Xiang Yang Ten, unquote. It's from 10, 2010, pages 86 to 88. So as I end, I want to thank you very much for joining us in these lectures. Take care and keep well. And the Lord bless you and keep you all. Amen.